question, but I will still say that he has been at the forefront of numerous innovations and reforms and was just before disposition the CEO of Niti Aayog, Government of India's premier think tank. Uh, we are honored to have your participation, Mr. Kant, and look forward to hearing from you. We are also privileged to have today public health experts from the region. Uh, as speakers, we have Dr. Eduardo Banzan, Principal Health Specialist from the Asian Development Bank in Manila. We have Professor Jerome Kim, Director General of the International Vaccine Institute. And we have Dr. Jeremy Lim, who's Director of the Leadership Institute of Global Health Transformation at the NUS School of Public Health. As discussant, we have Dr. Sunman Kwon, Health Economist and former Dean, of the School of Public Health at the Seoul National University. Our speakers bring a wealth of insights from the Southeast Asian region, and we welcome them, we welcome the chair and all the other participants who joined us in this discussion today. We will begin this uh, event uh, with remarks from Mr. Kant for about 10 minutes, followed by presentations from three speakers on the issues that I just mentioned. <clears throat> We then have Dr. Kwon discuss emerging insights from the presentations and he may build on them. And then final closing remarks from Mr. Kant again. So Mr. Kant, may I request you to share your remarks, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sandhya. Uh, thank you to you and to CSP for organizing this interaction. Uh, good evening to all and thanks for having me as the chair for this very timely event to discuss global health priorities for G20 from Southeast Asia's point of view. Southeast Asia comprises of more than 8% of the world population. Historically, priorities in the health sector for Southeast Asia can be encapsulated in a few specific areas. Universal health coverage, elimination of measles and rubella, preventing non-communicable diseases, reducing maternal under five and neonatal mortality, combating antimicrobial resistance, scaling up capacities for emergency risk management, eliminating neglected tropical diseases, and accelerating efforts to end TB, tuberculosis. Working on these priorities since the last few decades, has shown that substantial advancement have been made in the region. Be it decline in maternal and under five child mortality from malaria, elimination of maternal and neonatal tetanus, polio free, uh, and so on. Uh, now let us look at the health priorities India will be presenting in the G20. Health emergencies prevention, preparedness and response, strengthening cooperation in the pharmaceutical sector, use of digital health solutions for achieving UHC, <coughs> climate, and the impact of climate on health. If one observes the three, four core priorities India proposes to table at the G20, it is logical to say that these priorities are not restricted to India or the South Asia or to Southeast Asia or Asia at large. These priorities relate with the needs of the people of the world. These are the necessities of the day in healthcare delivery systems. These priorities have not come out of the blue. They draw their inspiration from the ancient Indian philosophy of Vasudev Kutumbakam, which means one earth, one family, one future. The receding but ongoing pandemic has shown that there were a lot of loopholes in the health care delivery system. We witnessed an absence of a response system to pandemics. We saw inequity in access to medical countermeasures. We also saw severe disruptions in the global supply chains. These shortcomings tested resilience of our societies. But in such challenging times, we also saw India emerge as a nation which saw the world as one family. We supplied essential medical assistance to more than 100 countries and made more than 280 million COVID-19 vaccines available to nations 
in immediate need of the same. We did this while ensuring that our population at home is vaccinated in mission mode. India had been the pharmacy of the world before the pandemic. But learning from the needs of the world during the pandemic, we successfully developed capacities to produce more than 5 billion COVID-19 vaccines annually in India. Efforts by India to increase its capacity show that India keeps the world's progress in mind while achieving its own. We are convinced that COVID-19 in one part of the world has very major implications in all other parts of the world. And therefore, we need to ensure that we are able to ensure that there's no COVID in any part of the world. Our priorities identified for the G20 also ensure that there is a continuity of efforts in taking forward works of previous G20 presidency. <coughs> for instance, Indonesia did excellent work on calling into action financing for TB, combating AMR, and implementing the One Health approach. Similarly, we are going to take forward the collaboration between finance and health ministries in the form of a task force, conceptualized by Saudi Arabia, Italy, and Indonesia. Coming back to the G20 priorities, we are trying to create something for the world which goes beyond the current pandemic. Our efforts are, all, are on to ensure that we have an effective health em emergencies PPR system. There is no inequity while accessing countermeasures, ensuring safe, effective, quality countermeasures, which are accessible and affordable. We also want to harness the digital technology in delivering healthcare services. Let us not forget, India undertook the world's largest vaccination program and backed it up with robust digital framework in the form of COVID. The world needs to see that digital technology can become an enabler in transforming health solutions. Lastly, we will also draw the world's attention to preventive health care in that a holistic science-based medical system for wellness as you are aware, India hosts the first and only WHO's Global Center for Traditional Medicines in Jamnagar, Gujarat. We have all been availing the benefits of yoga and Ayurveda for a long time. Along with the modern medical system, India will also promote the value and utility of the traditional systems of medicine. And therefore, while we may be the pharmacy of the world or the vaccine capital of the world, our belief is that along with Ayurveda and yoga, pharmacy and vaccination, we should take care of all the entire population of the world. Our belief is that it's one earth, one family, one future. Once again, I really want to thank all of you uh, for joining us today. I really want to thank CSP for collaborating with us. We expect your full support to achieve our collective objective of strengthening the global health architecture during India's G20 presidency. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I greatly appreciate the effort put in by CSP and Sandhya Venkatesh. Thank you so much, Mr. Khan. Thank you for this wonderful outline of the three issues, both during Indonesia's G20 presidency and what some of the priorities are that India has set already on the table. Um, uh, let's begin now with our three speakers. Uh, I'd like to begin with Dr. Jerome Kim, who will talk about research and development for medical countermeasures. Now, you know, there, there are many, many questions that we can deal with. And I, I just wanted to put uh, Dr. Kim three sort of very broad questions on the table, if you could uh, formulate your presentation around that. One is, how, you know, what are the mechanisms to accelerate R&D with an equitable, with a lens of equitable access? The second is uh, the whole issue of enabling R&D and man manufacturing across geographies. We find that they are to a large extent focused in the global north. How can this be spread more equitably across the world? And what sort of policy support and what sort of financing is required to enable this at scale? That's the second question. And the third and the last question is, again, it's a, it's a balanced question. R&D for you know, public health, global goods, 
vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, specific disease-specific uh, uh, local health goods. Uh, Mr. Kant referred to AMR. That's a very big issue, we know. So what is the, what is the kind of R&D that is happening? And is it balanced or is it skewed? And how can we get more balance? So um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thank you. And I'll just uh, share my screen. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And here we go. Greetings to all. My name is Jerome Kim. I'm the Director General of the International Vaccine Institute, an international organization dedicated to the discovery, development, and delivery of safe, effective, and affordable vaccines for global health. And I will speak tonight on R&D for global health goods. Oops. And it's not working. Ah, there we go. So I think the COVID-19 crisis um, has really emphasized that crisis, at least when it comes to vaccines, can indeed spur innovation. Uh, what you see in the, the gray box in the inset is that currently there are 172 vaccines for COVID still in clinical trials, 199 in preclinical development. And we have, of course, the great innovations. We'd never before had an RNA vaccine. We'd had only one minor example of an adenoviral vectored vaccine. Now we have vaccines based on chimpanzee adenoviruses, adenovirus type 5 and adenovirus type 26. We'd never had a licensed DNA vaccine. And now, of course, Zytus Cadilla has one. And we've used in much greater, to much greater extent, a host of new adjuvants. So we have now safety, and effectiveness data on a, a large number of new che of chemical entities that can be used to boost uh, immune responses. You can see again <clears throat> that crisis did indeed spur innovation. But as with everything, there was a cost. And the point here is that funding makes R&D innovation real and fast. And it actually, it's important to know enough funding makes R&D for innovation real and fast. And what you can see on the, in the graph here is that the European Union, the United States, the African Union, other countries had invested a significant amount in accelerating vaccine research and development. The United States put 18 billion into US dollars into something called Operation Warp Speed. CEPI put $1.53 billion. And these investments allowed companies to de-risk a process that sometimes results in 90% of, of vaccine antigens that start in the lab not making it through to licensure. And this rate of failure, 90%, is something that is deeply ingrained in vaccine manufacturing companies because this poses a risk. If they're looking at a, one, a $500 million to $1.5 billion investment in a new vaccine, they want to make sure that they're not going to throw away that money because of risky vaccine investments. So what countries were able to do, what Operation Warp Speed was able to do, what CEPI was able to do, was help to de-risk the process of vaccine development. And you can see the breakdown of where those funds went uh, on the right-hand side of, of the upper chart. And what you see on the bottom is the normal vaccine timeline. It's a process that starts in the laboratory, goes to phase one in humans, which does safety and immunogenicity, or largely safety, Phase two, which is larger, maybe several hundred people, that looks at uh, immunogenicity. Is the vaccine making the correct protective responses? And then finally to phase three. This is a process that takes a long time. Why? Because companies want to make sure as they move from phase one to phase two to phase three, their chances of success are increasing. So that although it's 90% failure rate in preclinical, in the laboratory, it is 75% success rate by the time you get to phase three. But what the funding for COVID-19 vaccines did was it significantly reduced the risk of companies by providing funding and allowing companies to proceed as quickly as possible. So this point again is that funding realizes innovation. But this is where the inequities come in. So you can see the scales on the left and the next pandemic on the right. And what are the things that are gonna keep us from responding well. So these are the five inequities. There were inequities in diagnostics, and, and this has been brought up to some extent before. You're not going to be afraid of a disease if you don't know it's there. If people aren't dying of the disease because the disease is not being diagnosed, 
then people aren't going to want to be vaccinated. Don't think that they need to be vaccinated, particularly if they've heard all these rumors or untruths about the safety and efficacy of vaccines. There is an equity in research and development funding, and I'll get to this because this is one of the main points um, that I'd like to highlight. There was inequity in manufacturing, and, and this point was, was made again, that, that a significant amount of manufacturing, particularly the manufacturing that was funded early on by the United States and by other organizations like CEPI, was in the global north. The next point is around vaccine supply, and was there fairness in the distribution of the vaccine that was produced? And finally, inequities in vaccination. And you know, we're still living with the legacy of inequities in vaccination. While the rest of the world has been vaccinated, sometimes with two or three or sometimes four or five doses of vaccine, about 80% of people living in low-income countries, primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa, have not seen a single dose, a single dose of vaccine. So these five inequities are inequities that we have to deal with if we want to successfully take on the next pandemic. But there were some solutions now, and they're not for everything. For around diagnostics, countries like Korea were able to you know, mass produce a huge number of test kits. And those test kits were used to great effect early on in the pandemic in order to enable successful control of COVID in a population until vaccines were available. Unfortunately, in many parts of the world, we didn't have that. So the official death rate and the official number of deaths from COVID um, if you look on the websites, it's 6.6 .6 million. The WHO estimate is somewhere between 15 and 20 million. The Institute for Health Metrics uh, says that it might be around 18 million. This gap is a problem uh, that we have with inequitable distribution of diagnostic kits. And it has a problem, and it's a problem that we're living with today because people in countries that didn't do diagnosis don't fear, don't think about, don't believe in COVID vaccines. The second inequity is around research and development funding. We'll get into that in a second. We tried to make a, a solution for manufacturing. And COVAX was supposed to be a mechanism that would allow um, vaccine, manu sorry, COVAX was a mechanism to distribute vaccine. And now we're, we're thinking that, you know, COVAX didn't work as it should. We anticipated having 2 billion doses of vaccine uh, distributed around the world by the end of 2021. In fact, only a billion doses were uh, were dispensed. So this didn't wasn't able to cover all the people that COVAX intended to cover originally. And this problem um, undermined uh, countries' belief and faith in COVAX. And so many countries scrambled to purchase whatever vaccine they could on the open market at whatever cost, <clears throat> whatever price they could afford. The second issue here is around the location of that manufacturing. And as, as is queer, uh, clear now, countries around the world view vaccine security as national priorities. The problem is that we now have 27 different countries in Africa that want their own vaccine manufacturing. And globally, you know, we went from having 12 major manufacturers to having four by the beginning of the 2000s. There was a consolidation, why? Because efficiency, um, gained certain advantages economically. Now, as we're redispersing manufacturing out so that regional manufacturing will become a reality, we have to really think about the sustainability of that manufacturing. And finally, around vaccination, and again, other people will discuss this to a greater extent, but you know, the vaccine supply problem was solved within 12 months. By the end of 2021, we had made 12 billion doses of vaccine. Countries were coming to IVI to say, is there anything you can do with this vaccine? Otherwise, we're gonna to have to destroy it. In the end, it wasn't supply. And it still remains that fragile healthcare systems are really unable to distribute the vaccine that people need to get in order to protect them against severe disease, hospitalization, and death. And until we can strengthen vaccination, this inequity will undermine all the other efforts to fix the other points. So this gets to where vaccine manufacturing is located. So everyone knows the United States, Northern Europe, uh, to some extent, uh, to, are, are the, the principal manufacturers, the, the headquarters of all the major um, high revenue vaccine companies. But these aren't the companies that distribute vaccine around the world. Every child around the world probably gets at least one dose of a vaccine made in India. 
Uh, many children get a vaccine, Japanese encephalitis vaccine, for example, made in China. These countries are, are part of the Developing Country Vaccine Manufacturers Network, the DCVMN. And you can see some of those companies from around the world that participated in the manufacture of COVID-19 vaccines. And when you look at the numbers, it is really striking the extent to which these companies provided vaccine uh, for the rest of the world. <clears throat> at the same time, the big companies internationally, AstraZeneca, Janssen, Pfizer, Moderna, had distributed vaccine manufacturing to other parts of the world in order to make sure that, that some supply uh, was available elsewhere. But this was, in a sense, a part of the manufacturing network that they used to manufacture the vaccine that they were going to use around the world. And it didn't necessarily address some of the issues uh, with inequity. In fact, when you look, developing country vaccine manufacturers contributed 60% of the doses of COVID-19 vaccines used globally. And you can see the breakdown here, China and India were major suppliers of, of those vaccines. They made, and that's not a, um, a correct number, vaccine manufacturers in total made 12 billion doses. The developing country vaccine manufacturers made 60%. 7.4 billion of those doses. But when you look at R&D funding, how much did they get? 5%. They got 5% of the R&D funding. So these manufacturers were making vaccines for other people, as Serum Institute made the AstraZeneca vaccine, SK Bioscience made AstraZeneca and Novavax vaccine. Chinese companies made vaccines that were developed and, and tested in China and elsewhere but they didn't get any of the Operation Warp Speed funding. They didn't get any of the funding from CEPI. There was a real inequity. And if we had given some of that research and development funding upfront to Biological E, would the Corbivax be available, have been available at the end of 2020 or in the middle of 2021, rather than being available much, much later? And would that have made a difference in terms of vaccinating people around the world and seeing impact from vaccination? When we don't allow the major manufacturers of vaccines globally to conduct the kind of research and development that was necessary and that they can do, and that they've proven that they can do um, for COVID and for other diseases, then we're really hamstringing, impairing our um, ability to respond effectively globally to pandemics. Why? Because inequities are a drag of impact. If the ultimate goal, and this is the ultimate goal, get as much safe and efficacious vaccine as possible into as many arms as possible to save as many lives as possible, as soon as possible, then inequity is a drag. It's an anchor that's keeping us from doing the things that we need to do. And in this case, it was research and development, funding inequity. And the consequence we're all too familiar with. Inability to get vaccine into arms, inability to protect people against COVID-19 infection, disease, and death had dramatic consequences. So now we have a 100-day mission to go from the sequence to emergency use approval in 100 days. In order to do that, we need funding equitable funding for R&D based on capacity. We need a regulatory apparatus that is prepared for expedited approvals. We need the kind of assessments that will prepare the laboratory and clinical trial sites um, to be able to evaluate these vaccines quickly. We need platforms, that is vaccine platforms, but we also need manufacturing platforms and process platforms that will get the vaccines uh, made according to the quality standards that are necessary for testing in humans. We need good participatory practices that will enroll people quickly, that will provide information to the community so that communities will participate in a knowledgeable way in the testing of vaccines. And finally, we need the correct and expedited ethical preparations in order to make sure that not only the experts uh, who sit in, in ethical review boards, but people around the world understand that we are conducting these trials in as ethical a manner as possible. But the real question here is, what is the DCVM role in the 100-day mission? And can we even foresee or think about an impactful real-world solution that does not have critical developing country vaccine manufacturer and regional R&D input? And I don't think, and I think that the answer to this question is no. 
In order to have an impactful response to the next pandemic, we need to fund those companies that manufacture the vaccines that the world uses. So to prevent another 1,000 day tragedy, developing countries, vaccine manufacturers, and equitable R&D must be a part of the 100 day mission. What you see on the map is the number of deaths, confirmed COVID-19 deaths per million people. So thank you very much. I hope I've been able to go through some of the questions that were posed, um, but I'm happy to answer any others. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kim. Yes, you have the key issue that you highlighted and which we know is the inequity in funding for R&D and manufacturing, and you laid a lot of emphasis on that. And actually, it would be great if India can take that up as a very big issue as part of its presidency. How do we get this geographically and in particular across the global south as well? So with that, I'm, I'm going to move to universal health coverage. I'm going to request uh, Dr. Jeremy Lim to speak about how UHC can be enabled at the country level. Um, because the conversation here is more from a global perspective, what the G20 can do, uh, I think we, uh, what, what I'm going to request you to do is keep the lens at the level of what are the policies, institutions, platforms at a global or a regional level that are required that can help countries promote UHC. Uh, that's one. And then secondly, what sort of alliances, institutions, and initiatives, uh, um, how can these be strengthened, again, to enable the development and sharing of global digital public health goods? Because uh, we do recognize, and Mr. Kant also mentioned, that that has become an important piece of global health, uh, digital health tools. Some countries have more expertise and have developed innovations. How can we facilitate this global exchange effectively? Uh, so, Dr. Lim, over to you, uh, 15 minutes. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much, Sandhya. And thank you to the organizers for the kind invitation. Greetings to all the participants from not so sunny Singapore. It's been raining every single day, right? Uh, but that really does should not dampen the enthusiasm for India's upcoming G20 presidency, uh, taking over from Indonesia, which is uh, Southeast Asia's largest country. And I thought it was very apt that I speak after Jerome, because Jerome has spent time um, really emphasizing the, the point that the world did pretty well scientifically, but fragile health systems, or what, he, or what if I can quote Jerome, that inequities drag on impact and the and these inequities really can be solved at least in large part by three letters UHC or universal health coverage and I think it's so Im, so important that we think about the last mile because that's where the real action happens and as was mentioned um, we can make the vaccines, but if they cannot be delivered and put into the arms of the citizens and of the ones who need them, then we have not achieved very much. So I want to move on to my next slide. Um, just some disclosures that I'm speaking to you today in, in my capacity as an, as an academic and as the director of the Global Health Program in the National University School of Public Health, but I also hold a number of different roles which are on this screen. But I wanted to spend the time really talking about universal health coverage and, and drawing reference to, uh, to well Sandhya's point around uh, what are some of the policies or the, or the platforms and I'll just say very upfront that universal health coverage is at its heart a moral and a political decision. And if we look at UHC implementation in many countries around the world, the same narrative is played out, right? That something happens in the political process that recognizes that citizens matter and citizens are very concerned about healthcare and access to decent healthcare for every, to every citizen. And when that time comes, locally, the world has to be ready to support these countries because as what uh, Prince Mahidon of, 
of Thailand. Uh, Songkla famously said that true that true knowledge is not in the learning but in the application to the benefit of of mankind and so once that political process once that decision has been made the world can step up to support and maybe sandhya what i would say is that because universal health coverage is a very local issue and it is political it has to be left to the citizens to sort out how universal health coverage and when it should be implemented in citizens own countries that said the international organizations such as the who and g20 can play a very powerful role in shining an intense spotlight on universal coverage and credit to margaret as well as dr tedros that they have uh, used the bully pulpit of the world health organization to constantly reinforce and I think Margaret has said so at least in three or four meetings that I was physically present that she's described universal coverage as the single most powerful concept that public health has to offer the world. And I think Dr. Tedros says it very strongly also that it is a scandal that a mother could lose her baby because the services needed to save it are too far away or sickness can plunge an entire family into poverty. And so it is moral, it is political, and platforms can play a very powerful role in, in framing the overall narrative and calling each other, or rather calling out each other, when we as individual countries have not lived up to our commitment to citizens. And that's why I think many of us in the in as panelists are old enough to remember the World Health Report 22 years ago that ranked health, health systems, very controversial, but it made the point that governments have a, have a very large role to play and that the world is watching. So whether it's the UHC index or any other metrics, the ability of international organizations to use their platforms to keep the spotlight on is a very powerful thing to allow for local ad advocates to be able to bring universal health coverage to the forefront of the local political agenda. And what then happens after that? We then have to support the countries and that's where Sandhya, the issues around capacity building, around technical support do come in very, very importantly. Um, we are amongst friends. I will be very practitioner focused and say that many countries are too embarrassed to learn from each other. And politically, it would be very difficult for one country to learn from another country if the political leaders do not see that the second country is, its, is more advanced. And therefore, uh, networks, regional initiatives such as ASEAN can be very powerful to encourage that sort of shared learning. The Rockefeller Gates Foundation Joint Learning Network has promoted a lot of good practices, a lot of mutual understanding, and there can be similar platforms to drive universal health coverage much more specifically. Um, I want to say a little about COVID. Uh, COVID, as what Jerome has, has shared very eloquently, highlights that these inequities drag down the entire world and these inequities are driven by absence of universal health coverage particularly at the primary health care level and i think this is an area that we can do better and this is an area that india has a lot to teach the world so i won't bore you with all of these quotes sufficient uh, really suffice to say that universal health coverage in a in a pandemic world is more urgent than ever um, and all that said, we must appreciate that healthcare was already broken before COVID. Right? This is the World Health Report. Uh, this is a this is a, a status tracking report from 2017, jointly put out by the World Health Organization as well as the World Bank, and it mentioned that more than half the world, 
that's just under 8 billion people at that point in time, did not have access to essential health services. And 100 million families were, were pushed into poverty, pushed into bankruptcy due to inability to pay for health care. And therefore, uh, COVID really simply made a bad situation even worse. But the silver lining is that it catalyzed needed reforms. It focused the world's attention uh, on the need to provide for everyone in that none of us are safe until all of us are are safe in a in a pandemic world and hence the political motivation as galvanized by platforms like the G20 can be very useful in mobilizing resources to support the countries that are less well resourced and there are many countries within ASEAN, within Southeast Asia, that would benefit tremendously from this assistance. Uh, and of course, uh, COVID has challenged fiscally many of our countries, and the situation is likely to get worse. Many countries in Southeast Asia, Singapore, Vietnam, Thailand, are also aging. And coupling the aftermath of the pandemic with with population aging, rising incidence of uh, chronic disease, and shrinking workforces, and particularly in the in the context of the Philippines, where where the healthcare workforce essentially supports the entire world, is so common for Filipino nurses to be seen in Australia, in Europe, and really so on. The healthcare situation is going to get even more difficult. And therefore, we do need to think about different and innovative solutions. Right? And finally, the point I wanted to make, and this is from a Financial Times article, um, that, that long COVID or the aftermath of well, COVID-19 seems to accelerate uh, chronic disease. And therefore, we do need to expect that there will be more demand pressures, and we will absolutely it is an imperative that we need new care models and again i want to highlight where india can teach the entire world some of these technology enabled models so the silver lining in my in my mind is that um the world has fundamentally changed there's so much acceptance of digital health modalities and expanded use of technology um I put this slide as this image that's on the left-hand side, partly in jest, but COVID has shown us that it's fully possible to moderate a session while one is in a car, while one is on the move. And it really um, highlights that we are mobile, we are connected wherever we are, and this has profound implications on how we think about healthcare delivery. Southeast Asia, a month ago, um, there was a list of the of the top 50 health tech startups, I would put it to you that just 10 years ago, we would be hard pressed to even find 50 health tech startups. And today we number in the hundreds, which can be augmented, which can be accelerated by the sort of scaling up that Indian startups are very, very known for, right? And finally, of course, uh, there's opportunity as what the BCG, the well, consulting firm, um, uh, analyzes that there's a lot of opportunity, at least 1.6 trillion can be saved globally each year through adoption of uh, digital services. So where then is this silver lining? And this piece I wrote for the for Asia Pathways um, two years ago, where I had um, reminded all of us that in, that in China, 60 years ago, the barefoot doctors or the community health workers um, had a profound impact on population health and on primary health care of the Chinese population. They were a part of the story that enabled China to uplift 800 million people out of poverty. Now we fast forward from the 1960s to the year 2022 to the year 2023, and with the tools, with the modern tools of connectivity of real-time um, um, really compute power, can we have the intimacy of a familiar trusted face, the community health worker with the power of the world's knowledge at the bedside? And I think the answer is yes, and we need to scale this very, very quickly, right? A lot of these technologies already exist today. Um, 
these are some of the, the companies around the world. Uh, Lifetrack is a company based in the Philippines. Chaos is in the US. Uh, many of them tend to be university spin-outs. I took this photo when I was in India, and this is in one of the Apollo Hospital community clinics where the very, very young, minimally active experienced GP or well family doctor is is was supported by an orthopedic surgeon in one of the Apollo hospitals. So whether it is remote consultation and support, whether it is AI enabled, technology allows us to deliver universal health coverage, primary health care, much more easily today because we are less reliant on a workforce that has to be highly skilled and in all the right places. So where does India come in? I would submit to you that India has leapfrogged the world at least twice. Once in the well-known information technology revolution, where India bypassed the so-called fixed line network and moved straight into mobile telecommunications. And today is, is well known that India has some of the cheapest and most competitive and high quality telecommunications providers. Right, fintech is another sector where, as this headline highlights, that Indians are skipping plastic money, jumping straight into mobile wallets. So India has the experience of innovating and importantly, innovating at scale. Right? And these are important lessons to showcase to the rest of the world, particularly for us in Southeast Asia. Right? Um, financial mobilization is definitely helpful. Right? But we have to go beyond that. Um, I, I mentioned at the start of this brief presentation that universal health coverage is at its heart a political decision and hence it is something that only citizens can legitimately participate fully in. Those of us who are outside the country, we can be cheerleaders, we can be technical support, uh, but we cannot be too intimately involved in the political process. However, where we can support is in, is in the uh, technical assistance, in the capacity building, and when the time comes to launch, um, to launch genuine universal health coverage, that's when resources like money and so on would be very, very useful. So um, I would say that uh, despite the, the gloominess of, of the COVID-19 pandemic, the manpower challenges, the fiscal tightening, there is opportunity. We have, particularly in Southeast Asia, a convergence of political will, recognition of the necessity to do things differently. We have the enabling technologies today. The consumer technology world has highlighted many innovations that we in healthcare can use. And COVID has shown that we need effective and well-functioning health systems, particularly in primary health care. And we have a systems understanding. What I hope that India can do in its G20 presidency is to support countries in Southeast Asia, working with entities within the region. Uh, all of our countries in Southeast Asia have got national universities, University of the Philippines in the Philippines, National University in Singapore, University Malaya. Right? We'll, all of us as universities would be happy to work with India to provide for capacity building, to sharpen the operating model know-how in India and really transplant it in other countries. And of course, India is very well known for its technology prowess. How can India play an upsized role in technology diffusion to enable genuine universal health coverage? And on this note, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to share some thoughts, Sandhya, and I'll be glad to take any questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lim. That was um, uh, very interesting. And as you very rightly said, that UHC is a political issue. Um, so, of course, one question becomes, how do we move the politics behind UHC? Uh, but perhaps that's a more complicated question. Even if we were to look at the digital solutions, as, as you pointed out, I mean, there are digital solutions, there are innovations, and maybe the egos of countries uh, sometimes constrain them from asking others. So the question then becomes, what sort of alliances, what sort of platforms, mechanisms can we 
created to enable this exchange. And I think, you know, with India focusing on digital health and India having a fair amount of expertise in this area, one of the big questions that India could look at is what sort of mechanisms can be put in place, regional and global, to facilitate uh, that exchange. Um, yes, absolutely. So with, with that, I'm going to move to uh, Dr. Eduardo Banzan. I think having heard the specifics of research and development and of UHC, an overarching burning question becomes what sort of governance mechanisms are required and what sort of financing mechanisms are required. Because both the earlier presentations, of course, talked a lot about financing, but when we are talking of global processes, regional processes, that notion of stewardship becomes very important. What sort of global stewardship exists to actually move what needs to be moved? And, um, uh, you know, the last three years, three years, right? Yeah, the last three years of COVID, uh, there's been a lot of talk on, on what sort of institutional mechanisms are required uh, for global health emergency management, for sharing of data and knowledge, for equitable distribution of resources, harmonizing global health protocols. All of these got highlighted as issues. Uh, what is that entity or a collection of entities that can enable this effectively uh, so that there aren't inequities across the globe as, as uh, Dr. Kim uh, spoke about. Um, so if you could touch upon that as well as, you know, what sort of um, financing mechanisms are required to do all of it, uh, that would take this conversation forward. Uh, over to you, uh, uh, Eduardo, uh, 15 minutes, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sandhya. Uh, and thank you, uh, sorry, Jerome and uh, Jeremy. It's always nice to follow uh, Jerome and Jeremy. And, and, and frankly, I would have, I, in a sense, I would just probably want to step back a bit when you start talking about governance and financing of uh, public health global public health goods because it is something that's you know in a, in a sense people are still sometimes arguing what it actually means uh but you know it, it was nice to reflect back back in 2002 that basically you know anything that requires multi-country collaboration would be those that uh we can consider global public health goods you know the lancet has joined into this discussion and they probably went a little more details on what needs to be uh, considered as global public health goods where you need countries to collaborate whether in a governance mechanism or financing and so that includes of course uh the, the product development of vaccines as highlighted by uh jerome uh pe pandemic preparedness then building on uh in a sense building uh, get, getting countries to agree on global or regional leadership over these concerns and so in a sense i would start probably by you know go what uh, Jeremy was talking about, you know, the WHO clearly has been uh, since you know since it came out in 1948, it's probably the the needs to be strengthened because it's already an instrument that has work uh, that has every country collaborating with each other and have actually have shown how it can basically uh, address and govern uh, health concerns, global health goods. That needs countries to colla to collaborate. So you know they have been, and the WHO even before the pandemic has really made efforts to uh, work into getting countries to work together. You know, like I always consider the international health regulations that it started in 2015 to be quite a uh, quite a wonderful instrument because it's actually really is legally binding to all WHO member states. And it gets the and it's and it is it is trying it has provisions that making WHO member states uh, to address concerns uh, uh, multi, uh, as globally uh, and one can probably say that the it is IHR actually help us globally in responding to the pandemic so WHO as an institution actually needs to be strengthened and moving forward. Uh, this is something that the G20 should look into. Uh, building new structures and institutions, you know, is always being recommended. But I think we already have something called the WHO that actually been doing its job. And so the challenge really is uh, build on the assessments that were done recently on you know the problems that they had in addressing COVID nineteen. 
addressing those uh, weaknesses, those problems that were identified and, and further strengthening it. Uh, we have also seen how, for example, the COVID pandemic, so the the process of WHO, the pre-qualification, the way it has been doing its uh, emergency use listing of vaccines was basically used by those who were helping finance the vaccines to ensure that the vaccines that were being developed all over the world to be were, were safe enough for all they became sort of the benchmark they they were uh ensuring uh that this the, the development that was happening at uh warp speed uh all over the world and so this is another in a sense example how who basically is showing that it it can be and it should be uh strengthened in governing global public health goods Another institution that's been there for quite some time is the United Nations. And, you know, sometimes we, we look at the United Nations as not really involved in health. But one of the, for me, the, the, the great success stories that I actually did is when it came out with the MDGs. And among the MDGs, and we all know that with the MDGs discussion, they say health was preferentially among all the MDGs. That's why if you look at the SDGs now, it's, it's quite really quite more comprehensive and health is just one of the sustainable development goals. But in the MDGs, uh, the MDG 6 in particular, 4, of course, is addressing child mortality, 5, maternal mortality. But MDG 6, which was trying to address TB, malaria, and uh, HIV AIDS, actually led to uh, what became a mobilization of uh, resources, both government and government. Uh, public private resources into what became uh, the global fund to fight malaria tv and uh it's an aids of course the mdg on child mortality also led into what became the gavi alliance and and these are in a sense global uh, mechanisms where the, the countries different countries uh, developed countries private sectors uh businesses philanthropies basically mobilize money to uh, to help address to help the uh, to so that the world can address very specific goals that was written in the MDGs and of course the United Nations that led this, and we saw of course how uh, we have a criticism of what Covax was able to deliver in its promise, but at least you know the the presence of the Gavi, uh, the WHO spearheading it, and of course CP was a sort of a product, uh, a sort of a continued efforts to um, mobilize more resources again uh, on vaccines led to what became COVAX. And I think the lesson that we have to see is how can we make COVAX uh, or a, a mechanism like COVAX work better in the next pandemic. And of course, we're now seeing that uh, as what Jeremy said, uh, the G20, the health finance ministers agreed to launch a pandemic fund. And it's quite interesting now on how this pandemic fund uh, which, of course, also involves the WHO, uh, and now much more stronger involvement of the developed countries, be able to uh, ensure and mobilize more financing in, in strengthening pandemic preparedness, something that we have sort of agreed so among the global public health goods. Now, I'll probably end my uh, presentation with reflecting on what Southeast Asia has been doing and I think this is this are what probably what Southeast Asia is doing. You could provide uh, sort of some ins insights to India and uh, its leadership of G20. So one of the things that Southeast Asia is uh, now pushing is something called well, it's not. It's not it's out, it's out in Asia is not ahead of this. Uh, we some we we sometimes call it the Southeast Asia Center for Disease Control. A very specific name is the Asian Center for Public Health em uh, Emergencies and Emerging Diseases. And essentially, it's really calling all for countries in Southeast Asia to work together uh, to share disease, uh, to do disease surveillance regionally, to get every country share their uh, uh, monitoring of diseases. Uh, very similar to what, of course, uh, Africa has done with the African Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Now, what's quite interesting is the uh, APCHED is actually driven by ASEAN, very similar to how the African Center for Disease Control and Prevention is driven by the African Union. So, what we're seeing, so in a sense, you already have existing. Uh, political association or uh, uh, cooperative association of countries, ASEAN, African Union, 
And if we include the European ones, there are the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, the European Union. So you build on this existing structure of collaboration, uh, which the AU, EU, and ASEAN has already built, uh, and then basically leverage that to put something like a regional CDC. Now, the uh, ASEAN or the Southeast Asian uh, CDC is still in its uh, infancy, it's, you know, but it's moving forward. And this is something that uh, we consider really as a, 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 a good platform for uh, governance, for, for addressing global public health goods. Another thing that ASEAN is looking at is something which was a discussion that started a declaration that was done prior to the pandemic, which is a declaration uh, ASEAN looking for vaccine security and self-reliance. Now, the pandemic obviously has uh, delayed some of the, 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 the dialogues. And it is only now that the pandemic, as, 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 as we move from the pandemic, that ASEAN is now having more strategic, more focused approach on how to build up vaccine security and self-reliance. Now, among the points that Jerome was saying, you know, when the when the pandemic happened, most of the investment was happening in developed countries. So what the ASEAN, the ASEAN uh, self-sufficiency uh, strategy is probably they're looking at that this uh, investments be done more now in developing countries like ASEAN. And it's quite interesting to see. So this is the WHO uh, assessment of national regulatory authorities. So if you are, uh, so part of the reason that they focus on developed countries was this, was the was the point that the regulatory agency was strongest in the developed countries and was supposed to be not that strong in developing countries. So now the WHO have come out with this benchmarking tool where they now have assessed. And in a sense, the WHO imprimatur is basically now being used by countries to argue that they can regulate uh, vaccine manufacturing and, of course, uh, do the necessary pharmacovalence for vaccine. It's quite interesting that here, three countries in the ASEAN, uh, Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam, have now been um, assessed as a um, uh, maturity level three, and Singapore was recently assessed this year as maturity level four. Now, having this strong national regulatory authority in these ASEAN countries actually uh, lays down, uh, so, uh, supports, enables uh, more investments in vaccine manufacturing and development in the ASEAN countries. So we will continue to monitor the discussion of ASEAN on how they want to move forward with vaccine security and self-sufficiency. And it will be something I think that the G20 India would like to bring and be part of the dialogue uh, in the coming year. Now, of course, uh, the Asian Development Bank has, uh, where, where, where I am, principal health specialist for Southeast Asia, but also mobilize financing. Uh, it's the, uh, the, the 9 billion facility, of course, is not just for Southeast Asia. It's actually a facility for all of the ADB's regional, uh, 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 sorry, all of ADB's member countries from Central Asia to the Pacific. But nonetheless, it actually highlights the role that development banks can do in financing uh, regional, uh, sorry, global or regional public health, uh, public health goods. Finally, uh, the point that was raised by uh, Jeremy in, in UHC in countries actually makes me want to highlight this work that we're doing in the greater Mekong sub region where, where ADB is not just supporting universal health coverage within countries, but in a sense beyond borders. So we know that people move around in, in, our, in our world. So in the greater Mekong sub region, so this is Vietnam, uh, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia. Uh, people, uh, the movement of people across borders is quite significant, and and we we want to we want to help ensure that when one uh, citizen from Laos moves to Thailand or from Vietnam moves to Cambodia, the coverage that this this country UHC is is is, is conti continued on across borders, and this is uh, ongoing work that we're trying to see. It's a little difficult. Uh, but we do have models in other regions, like in the Caribbean and, of course, in the European Union, where you have this uh, portability of health coverage. So even as we will support countries uh, implement 
uh, and pursue universal health coverage, we will also help countries pursue UHC beyond borders. So, uh, as G20, as uh, India, as the host of the G20, what are the things that it may want to explore uh, in in, uh, in, uh, in the coming year? Well, as we we'll, I just like to emphasize again, you know, the WHO is already an institution that we have, which. Uh, an existing institution that can lead that can be the lead governance uh, entity for global public health goods, uh, and I think we should uh, sustain efforts in strengthening it. Now, the G20, of course, have come out of pandemic fund, and one of the things, and it is of course collaborating with regional development banks. But I think this uh, collaboration with the regional development banks should be emphasized uh, because the regional development banks do have that ability of better understanding their developing member countries uh, than the global ones. Then you have, of course, the regional CDC. Uh, we already have the model, the Africa uh, CDC, the European one, APCHED. So the G20 next year could look into supporting more of the regional CDCs. I have to acknowledge, I don't know whether there's a South Asia CDC, but this may be something that ought to be explored. We, uh, the, there should be more dialogue and actions on uh, vaccine security and self-sufficiency of developing countries. It's something nice to, to just announce as a slogan sometimes, but we need to have these discussions because this would need con some countries to say, okay, I want to do uh, uh, product, uh, so manufacturing, but of course it would, these countries would need assurances that in the next pandemic, they will be provided the vaccines. Of course, we need to uh, support universal healthcare uh, within countries. Wonderful presentation, uh, Jeremy, on, on highlighting the strengths of India on how it can support UHC within countries. But more than that, I think with the digital health uh, strength of India, it can really uh, get UHC beyond borders something, put in the agenda, and hopefully uh, get that this uh, this call for UHC beyond borders really uh, emphasize during the G20. Uh, Sandhya, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Banzan. That was um, very interesting. Um, you've highlighted many of the institutions and the platforms that, that are there. And what you're suggesting is send them those platforms rather than reinvent the wheel and correct, uh, um, create new institutions and platforms except in cases like, let's say a regional CDC. So, you know, if the region does, doesn't have CDCs, maybe those could be created and, and, and that's an interesting thought. Uh, but otherwise, you know, put your weight behind, let's say the fund that has been created and, and, and build capacity. So that's very valuable. So finally, uh, we come to our discussant, uh, uh, Dr. Sunman Kwan. And I would request you to sort of surface some of the insights that are emerging from the three speakers with a specific focus on, okay, what would be your, um, um, uh, if I can use a big word, recommendation uh, to the Indian government that these are the three or four issues that are important to focus on. Uh, over to you, Dr. Kwan. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh... Thank you for inviting me to this uh, meeting and uh, also thanks a lot for all those PP presentations. I learned a lot uh, from these valuable presentations. Um, these all three topics are very important um, and especially during this COVID-19, we learned that uh, we need to a good capacity building and role of not only the national governments, each country level, but also we need something, I mean, uh, good collaboration, uh, coordination in a regional and, and, and global level. Um, first of all, in terms of national level, um, we know that uh, like in the UHC and, and, and digital transformation and pandemic preparedness, we need to have a good domestic resource or it, it can be a political resource and also a, a economic resource mobilization for, for all of these. Uh, uh, and technological innovations, uh, and also in terms of the acceptability of by providers, consumers, and also governance issues across different uh, ministries, different sectors, uh, are all very important. Uh, but most of all, I think uh, we learned that uh, 
you know, as, as COVID means or pandemic mean, means that nobody is safe until everybody is safe, that we need to really uh, introduce or get a consensus on something about the, the regional level or, or global level uh, collaborations. But um, there are many challenges because it is it's so-called a global public good. Uh, so there's always a uh, incentives or, or hope that other countries are doing and also different uh, thinkings and expectations among uh, high income countries and uh, low income countries. A very similar example uh, is from the global coordination with the climate change. So we need to do something. And also in that sense, uh, development partners or some some leadership of, of several uh, countries are very important. In terms of then, what, what are the, uh, the, the the most specific ones to think about? Uh, I think, for example, uh, in in the regulation and policy response to a, a pandemic, I think that the collaboration or reform in the international health regulations. And we can encourage the data sharing of more countries in, in, in those issues. Uh, and, and also we learned a lot and, and we, we suffer a lot uh, and we have a very serious concerns in the global inequity in the access to, to medicines or vaccines. So to overcome the challenges in the access to or vaccines or medicines or, or necessary health care. First of all, it's important that each country have a good uh, universal health coverage systems that, that covers not only essential health care, but also uh, essential public health interventions and, and medicines and, and technologies. So, so definitely uh, UHC should be a, a very high of higher uh, priority. But at the same time, uh, you know, Many low-income countries have challenges uh, in in the production uh, and distribution of uh, medicines and technology. So, in that sense, we need a more concrete le uh, level uh, global financial facilities to ensure or improve the equity uh, in the access to to medicines and vaccines. And uh, the Dodo mentioned that the uh, ASEAN initiatives in uh, in the new financing facilities and also ADB's role in the financing facilities for vaccines. I think we need to have a more concrete ideas and consensus and detailed programs how to, how to make it play a bigger role uh, in, in the coming uh, pandemic. And I think it's the same case for digital transformation that is a bit mentioned by the Jeremy, because, you know, one typical form of digital transformation is the non-phase, I mean, e-health or e-consultation and e-prescriptions. That means that the, the, the patients get consultations from doctors abroad through, through or uh, e-modality. So we need a uh, collaboration among government in the regional or global level in terms of the standards and quality of care. And, and most importantly, I agree with uh, Jerome that um, we need to think about this, how to improve the equity in the RD capacity to to the vaccines and essential medicines. And in that sense, I think, um, what is the role of the development partners or some leading countries? Because for a long time, development partners and, and some high income leading countries have invested a lot in strengthening the capacity of individual countries in the policy capacity or, or some medicines capacity. But I think there should be a, uh, a more balance and more focus on how to uh, increase this the, the capacity of R&D of countries or how to increase uh, the funding to the R&D in pandemics or R&D in the also neglected tropical disease. So I hope that uh, there is is more increased awareness and more increased investment by development partners or the leading countries around the world. And um, Dodo's presentation shows some, you know, uh, additional incentive. I mean.
Okay, so, and then it's very unique because so, so called could great the Mekong sub regions they have uh, many countries they uh, uh, have shared cultures and history and they have an existing mechanism of ASEAN so the question is in the globally do we need a additional uh, governance structure or mechanism to handle those issues that we have been discussing or, or can we uh, strengthen the capacity of existing uh, agencies like uh, you know, WHO, for example. So there are there are pros, pros and cons, and we do not want to fragment. We do not want to uh, introduce another fragmentation in, in in the landscape. So we should uh, calculate, consider both and pros and cons of of what is the best way to increase the, the global level or regional level collaboration and and and, and uh, coordination in in these whole areas. Finally. We talked a lot on you know, pandemics, and um, it is true that uh, we need to improve the, our preparedness and response capacity. But at the same time, we should not forget that there's another, there are so many other health issues that uh, we are facing these days. For example, uh, you know, in Asia and globally, uh, population are very rapidly aging. And there are uh, huge issues of uh, non-communicable disease and some countries, especially like the Pacific Islands, they are facing so-called NCD tsunami. And, and related issues is the climate change and health. Uh, and also, I mean, it, it, during this pan pandemic crisis and also uh, from the experience of the rapid aging of population, we learned the primary care, again, is so important. So all these uh, issues uh, should not neglected and uh, we should also pay kind of a balanced uh, perspective and balanced investment and equity not only in, in pandemic uh, COVID-19 uh, but also on this type of uh, old and on also emerging uh, health challenges uh, in the region and in, in the globe and uh, really think uh, should work hard to, to get a consensus on the regional uh, and global level uh, collaboration in these areas. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Kwan. I think you've raised a lot of questions. You underlined a lot of questions. Uh, we have to um, still work and find some of the answers. And I look forward to working with all of you as we move forward over the next few months to find answers to some of these questions. I'm going to now uh, request uh, Mr. Khan to sort of share his remarks, having heard some of these presentations uh, and, and how he has processed them. So. Uh, thank you, Sandhya. Uh, uh, first of all, let me uh, thank all the speakers. Uh, I would like to personally thank uh, Eduardo Banzom, the principal health specialist of ADB, I'd like to thank uh, Jeremy Lim, the Director Light of NUS School of Public Health. I would like to thank Jerome Kim, the Director General of International Vaccine Institute. And I would like to thank uh, uh, Sunman Kwon, uh, the Professor of Health Economics and Policies, Seoul National University, for their very, very important inputs. Uh, we in uh, uh, the G20 Secretariat and I, as Sherpa, have taken note of this, all their uh, expert advice, their guidance to further strengthen our G20 Health Working Group agenda. We have greatly benefited from the inputs given by them and their expertise uh, I greatly ap appreciate. Uh, today's discussion highlighted the need to further deliberate on the issues of governance and financing of global health, funding of research and development, as well as the manufacturing of medical countermeasure and moving towards delivery of global public health goods, uh, also on climate and health, which is very important to my mind, and lastly, on ensuring universal health coverage for all. I would like to say that India has been handed over the presidency at a time when the world is trying to keep up with several challenges such as geopolitical tensions, economic downturn, 
supply chain disruptions and subsequent rising food, fuel and fertilizer prices, alongside tackling the long-term ill effect of the pandemic. We should also realize that because of COVID, 200 million people have gone below poverty line, uh, 75 million people have lost their jobs, and uh, we, instead of progressing, we have regressed at the midway point as far as the sustainable development goals are concerned. As the G20 presidency, India will aim to translate today's deliberations into concrete deliverables within a designated time frame amongst G20 member countries to make a meaningful impact, keeping in mind future for all. The Prime Minister has already said that India's G20 presidency will be inclusive and will be ambitious and action oriented. Today, it is an acknowledged fact that universal health coverage can be ensured by building a resilient healthcare system, beginning from strengthening the primary healthcare services provided with implementation of digital health solutions. And this would be fundamental to building back better for a much better tomorrow. Not only access, but affordability at which medical countermeasures are made available is a very critical challenge to be considered. Whether a vaccine is available at 20 US dollars or 3 US dollar will have a major role in managing any future health emergency and hence the need to focus on cost effective, high quality research and development. Uh, I'm uh, truly, uh, you know, principles of sustainability, inclusiveness, and, uh, you know, inclusiveness, holistic vision, account, transparency, accountability, foresight, and equality and equity must be at the center of a governance transformation of health. We all would agree that the world needs inclusive and effective policies to deliver equitable and better social, economic, and health responses. In order to ensure healthy lives and promote well being for all. Drawing from issues as discussed during past G20 presidencies, the Indian presidency seeks to take it a step forward by ensuring delivery of concrete outputs, accounting for the inevitable dimensions of quality and access along with affordability of medical countermeasures across the world. Additionally, India's health agenda would also take up the issue of inclusive digital health solutions with their transformative potential of bridging the digital divide in the world by connecting all stakeholders through commonly accepted data structures and vocabulary. Digital public goods such as telemedicine, teleradiology and other AI enabled IT solutions are some of the areas that G20 members could collectively work on to build resilient health systems. I would, in the end, like to conclude and thank CSEP for putting together this very, very distinguished and esteemed panel of speakers today. And I would like to take this opportunity to urge all those who have gathered today to support India's line of efforts during its G20 presidency so that India emerges as a stronger world leader, ensuring that the benefits of development are accessible to all our brothers and sisters across the world. This is critical, and especially for those in the low and middle income countries. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I once again thank all of you experts, and I thank, uh, greatly thank CSP for doing this workshop. We have greatly benefited from it.
Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Khan. Thank you for your kind words. More importantly, thank you for outlining India's focus and the key issues that you've so succinctly underlined that India is focused on, focusing on, which are, you know, many of the central issues that are, uh, if I may say, plaguing the world today. Uh, we are on time. I am not going to take very much time. I would also underline uh, my gratitude to all of you for participating. It's been a very useful and rich discussion. Uh, thank you, Professor Korn, Professor Kim, uh, Dr. Banzon, Dr. Lim, of course, and, and, and Mr. Khan. Thank you very much for, for being here. I look forward to working with some of you to deepen some of the key issues that, that came up today uh, so we can continue to engage with the government of India on these issues. And I just wanted to say that this conversation was focused on Southeast Asia. We are hoping to do a similar one focused on Africa and uh, look forward to your participation in that. So thank you very much. And, and with that, good evening.